All right, let's get started, everybody. Come on, work. Good morning, guys. Happy Tuesday. How's everybody doing? Uh, <laughs> everyone survived the hard freeze. Did it ever freeze up here in Jax? Yeah. Days ago, Once over the weekend, we were down in Plant City, and like literally, we we're getting like phone warnings. Like our phones were buzzing, like hard freeze alert, and everything. Yeah, yeah, you trickle it. Really? <laughs> One of the campgrounds that we like to go to in Itchituckme, um, I saw they handed out a. Um, uh, like certificates for all the campers that night because it like got down to frozen no, freezing. Uh, it's right now. It's Springs. Yeah. So it's a Tuckney Springs campground. It's not part of the park. It's okay. just north yeah, of there. That's why I'm not gonna watch. Yeah. It should be open. Yeah. Or is it just like the trams that stop running? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. The, I don't know why you'd want to go. Yeah. Oh, that's the best time. Nobody's there. It's frozen. No, the water's the same temperature. Put the wetsuit on. You're good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Nobody's there. Yeah, I mean that's the that's literally this is the best time to go. Yeah, no one's there to save you when you die. Ah, whatever. All right, let's get started. Um, we're gonna continue on for soil and composition and all that fun weight and relationship stuff. And then we're going to also um, start talking about the actual grain size and the differences between the soil components. Um, and then actually that's gonna be it for our first little trimester. That's a weird way of saying it, but first little section of our schedule. Um, Keep a note for this and also remember guys, I suck at dates. So um, always go based off of the actual day, Tuesday and Thursday. I can never keep the numbers correct. Um, you'll already see that this was of the 11th. Your exam is not on the 11th, it's on the 10th on the Thursday. Thank you, Elias. And um, so just make a note of that. And it's already coming up. It's already, what, is it February 1st already today? And then February is like a week long and then it's March and it's spring break and then we're pretty much done. So just stay up to date. What's up? So just make sure the February 10th date is the correct one, not the Right. Okay. Wait, what is Thursday? Around. Thursday is February 10th, right? Let's find out. It's <laughs> always oh, like, oh, you, put, you put the date right for Tuesday, yeah, then you have two days, it's the 10th. Yeah, that, that would have been a good way to. Thursday of next week. Okay. The Thursday of next week, when the moon is right 30 degrees south, southeast of Polaris, minor, whatever. I don't know. But it's it's just next Thursday. So um, actually, today we might be able to wrap up everything for the class for this first exam. Um, so I will let you guys know about if the exam review is going to be moved up to Thursday. And then maybe next Tuesday, we won't have a class. It'll just be like a question answer. Maybe we'll do like a jeopardy game or something so keep that in mind like stay up to date on the canvas um, page like if you don't already it would probably just, just be safe like before you come to class on tuesday just check your phone and make sure i don't send out an email um you know that class is canceling you drive all the way here for nothing same for you guys on online listening just check your email okay oh wait one more thing lab report one is due this week I've already seen a few people um, submitting them, so thank you for that. Um, again, like you're, you should only see the assignment for your specific section. So if you see a different assignment on there and there's like, you know, you come to section one, but you have a section three assignment, let me know because something messed up in Canvas. And then the homeworks are also going to be due on Thursday by midnight. So again, these are midnight. Homeworks will always be due at midnight. Um, and then, but the lab reports are always going to be due by 5 p.m. Because that's what it's usually like in the real world. So 5 p.m. tonight. So keep a, uh, up to date on that. All right. So components, volumetric relationships, sticking around in these for the one and a half people who actually check out the textbooks. And what we ended on um, was talking about the different components of soil. Again, if you take a scoop of soil outside and look at it, it looks like a bunch of combination of 
different size particles. Those particles can be different sizes. Those particles can be different um, composition, like what, you know, residual soil, uh, aeolian soil, lacustrian soil can be different things like that. Can also be different mineralogies. Um, so it's just like a combination of a bunch of different things. And depending on where you are geologically, uh, kind of gives us an idea of what type it is. Um, but the big picture thing that we care about for engineering purposes is the size of the particles. Um, so what we're going to start looking into are the four components, the four general particle sizes. That's clay size, silt size, sand size, and then gravel size. So in geotechnical engineering, most of the time we're just focused on these guys right here, sand, silts, clay, and gravel, or sorry, sand, silts, and clay. Um, if you remember from CE materials, we use gravel a lot in um, the concrete and asphalt design, but most natural soils, especially in Florida, will have sand, silt, and clay sizes. Um, and there's different languages. Again, I say the word language, but what, what I'm saying is there's different ways of like classifying these sizes um, that we'll talk about in after the exam. Um, but in general, we can see that the sand size particles are things that are anywhere between like 10 millimeters to 0.1 millimeter. And then everything is getting smaller and clay is something that we cannot see with our naked eye. You have to use an electron microscope, something really, really small. And again, what you'll see is we differentiate between the two behaviors of, and the two behavior or physical shapes of um, sands and clays, because sands you can picture as sphere-like particles. And then clays you can picture like these really small plate-like rods stacked on top of each other. I'll show some examples in this class. And then sil silts are kind of like that weird, like awkward stepbrother who's like half and half, like, you know, half silt, half clay, like still small like clay, but then it's also more rounded and gravel-ish like, um, like sand particles. So we'll just go through the differences of, of all those throughout this lecture. So um, we already said clays and silts are considered fine grain soils. And those are particles that you cannot see with um, your eye, um, unless you're really, really good at seeing. Um, and then sand and gravel are coarse grained. So if you generally hear the term fine grained and coarse grain, just know that those are the two things that we're talking about. Coarse grain is gonna be sands and gravels. Fine grain is going to be silts and clays. Now their characteristics are different and these are based off of the shape and the size of the particle. So uh, clays are what we will call cohesive soil. So what is cohesive soil? Like what, when you think of cohesive, what do you think of? Somebody can just say it. Binding together, yeah, yeah. And if you guys saw, everyone went through the lab last week, right? There was one soil that was just like a bunch of Play-Doh blobs of stuff stuck together, right? So that soil was not like the other ones that would just fall apart when you held it. It would stick together, it had cohesiveness. So that was a clay soil that you worked with. We're, it's also what we call plastic. And again, that means there is permanent deformation, permanent deformation. So if you remember from our CE materials, when we were uh, bending the steel and pulling the steel apart, it reached a, single, a, a certain point in the stress strain diagram that whenever we reach a certain deformation, if we unloaded it, there would be permanent deformation. Um, and although it's a little different mechanically in soil, it's still the same principally. So if we have that clay soil and we move it and we bend it and we let go of the load, like we you know, stop holding on to it, then it'll stay permanently deformed. Where like sand or, or gravel does not have that characteristic. It'll just fall back to the gravitational forces. So for silt, what we call this is cohesionless. but it can be plastic, but it is frictional. So I probably should have done sands and gravels first because you'll see that silts are like the weird in between, between clays and sands and gravels. But for silts, 
mainly you're not going to see them stick together like we saw like that Play-Doh bulb um, at, at, in class, right? It's gonna be somewhat behaving more like the sandy material, but then also can still have plastic characteristics. So you'll see throughout this class, like silty soils are generally really hard to characterize. Um, and even when you start working, if you're working with a geotech in any project or working for a geotech, when we identify these silty soils, you usually do a few more tests to understand the full like composition and understand how it is strength wise. So like the sands and gravels, this is cohesionless. It is non-plastic and it is frictional. So um, what we'll also see throughout this class is how water affects these three types of material. Um, and the reason water affects them differently is, again, because of the size of the actual particle itself. Um, water particles, has anyone seen like a water molecule before? Me neither. I'm, I can imagine what it looks like, though, because like you can see pictures of it and stuff. But water molecules are really small, right? Like you can imagine it's like one thing and two hydrogens next to it. Um, so clay particles are really small, too. So they are very equivalent in size compared to sands and gravels where you have these larger respective particles compared to water. So these particles affect the, the arrangement, the structure of the clay particles, the, the water particles do, um, due to the size affection. So the effect of water on the engineering behavior of clays, I'm just gonna say is huge. So there's a specific test in specific labs that we perform on clay soil just to define how the water content changes its engineering behavior. And when I mean the engineering behavior, I mean the strength and the compressibility, the things that we as engineers care about because we need to understand when we put our building on top of this clay, how it's going to react to loading. So this is really tricky because just in some areas, the water content can be completely different than a different area just due to the way the you know, the natural groundwater regime is or how like precipitation is in the area and that kind of stuff. So it's very important to define the engineering behavior for clays when it comes to the effects of water. For silts or for sands and gravels, I'll do it this way. Sands and gravels, I'm just going to say, nah, there's not that much. Um, and then I, I'm going to put a little asterisk here or for, for this class at least. So for general basic soil mechanics, we'll see that sands and gravels, whether the moisture content, like what the moisture content is, it really doesn't affect the engineering behavior. Most of the sand and the gravel is going to get its strength from the friction of the particles rubbing up against each other and the angularity. If we add water into that, then cool, it, like it might be easier to, to transport. It might be a little bit heavier. It'll have a different density, but it really doesn't affect the strength as much as we see for silts and clays. So of course for silts, just kind of being in the middle, just going to say kind of. So, but it's more like, more like sands for this. So again, through the whole thing here, you'll see silts are kind of the middle, middle man, like the bridging the gap, same, similar size particles as clay, but same shape as our sands and gravels. So um, water still affects them, and we still do different tests on silt specifically to understand how much it behaves like clay or how much it behaves like, like um, sands and gravels. So the effect on density on the engineering behavior. So again, density is mass divided by volume. So if we have a set block, like a cubic foot block, how much mass of soil is in there is going to affect the strength, obviously, for the sands and gravel. So I'm gonna say, I don't know how to spell huge. And again, for sands and gravels, it's all based off of friction. So it gets its strength from the particles, the angularity rubbing up on top of each other and all that interlocking like beads of stuff, whatever you wanna call it. So it's really large for this. So if we have a very loose soil, not a lot of, of material matter in a volume, 
then it, there's going to be less potential of those particles locking together, and then we're going to have a lower strength. On the clays, I'm going to say not so much. So again, the strength for the clay is all based off of the cohesion of the clay. So those are the particles sticking together due to the electrostatic forces. And when we look at clays like super, super close up, we'll actually see a lot of the clay particles aren't even touching. They're just being suspended around each other. Um, so density does not play as much of a role in the strength um, or the engineering behavior for clays. It's still an important property and we still determine the density because we need that to determine how much it's gonna weigh and all that stuff. Um, but it's not nearly as much as for sands and gravel. And then, so of course, our kinda, kinda guy silt here. Silts are somewhere in between again, um, where density is not as important because it still has some residual strength from the cohesive nature and the, the plastic nature if those clays are, or silts are plastic. So I was like visualizing particles, like, you know, in like relative terms and stuff. Um, these are the general sizes, gravel size, gravel size particles according to the unified soil classification system, which is one of the languages that we're gonna talk about next um, in, in a few weeks. Um, gravel size particles are anywhere between 20 millimeters to 4.75 millimeters. So again, that 4.75 millimeter, if you remember, that's our number 200 seed, or sorry, number four seed. Sand particles are from 4.75 millimeters to 0 0.075 millimeters. So that's our number 200 sieve. Silt size particles go below the number 200 sieve. So that's 0 0.075 to 0 0.001 millimeter. And then anything less than 0 0.001 millimeter, or sorry, 0 0.002 millimeter is um, a clay size particles. And then we have another one too that you may sometimes see that's called colloidal particle. And that's anything that is, what is it, less, less than one micrometer. And then the micro. I'm standing there six. So something really, really small. These are usually just suspended, and like that's what our, our chemistry and our material science friends care about. But if we have if this shape was a gravel sized particle, I usually like illustrating this. Imagine this is like a trampoline, because most of us, if we grew up in the 90s or early 2000s, probably had a friend or at least had a trampoline. So if this gravel sized particle was like the size of a trampoline, 20 millimeters, that would mean the sand sized particle would be like the size of like a, a bowling ball or a tennis ball, depending on that range somewhere, right? And this is the actual mix of it. So I'm just gonna say tennis ball, even though that looks like a really big tennis ball. That would mean our silt sized particle would be much, much smaller. I don't remember what that is. I think it's like a flea or something. So really, really small. And then our clay size particle, you can't even really see it. So just think about this again, like the size comparison when it comes to natural soil. Like you could take a scoop of soil up out of the ground and there will be all four of these particles in that scoop of soil. Um, so the, the way the clay interacts and changes the strength of the gravel particle is gonna be a big role. You know, if we have a lot of clay surrounding that gravel, it's going to affect the density. It's going to affect the other things. Um, and that's why defining the characteristics of how much of each soil particle in your soil is really important when it comes to the strength. Right, so that's just another thing. Oftentimes you'll see this in when we're talking about the soil particle sizes in micrometer. So I just wanted to again send the reminder of what that is. Micro is just the opposite of mega, so negative six instead of 10 to the six.
So the behavior of the grain size is important for each different types. Here we can see some scanning electron microscope images of different types. So this is the one on the left, that scale of this is about 10 millimeters. Um, so just to get an idea again, we've probably seen this. If you've been to the beach looking for shark teeth or something, you scoop it up, you can see the individual grains of everything, right? Um, everything in between, this is what a silt particle looks like. You can see it's very similar in uh, angularity when it comes to a sand particle, um, but it is much, much smaller. So instead of 10 millimeter scale there, it's 50 micrometers. So we can't see this with our naked eye, even though it looks the same as the sand particles and have angularity. And then this other one, this is our fun add a pole jack clay in Florida here, and it looks like it's just a bunch of straws stacked together, right? So the actual individual particles, or maybe it looks like spaghetti noodles if you don't know how to cook spaghetti. Like these are these individual particles and they're just stacked up on top of each other in the orientation. So that's why the deposition of these clay particles, the fluid that is within these clay particles, as well as the mineral that is actually making up this clay particle is really important because that affects how those things stack up against each other, the orientation that they are stacked up against each other, and um, overall the strength of the clay particle. Again, we're looking at the size comparison here, 50 micrometers and then five micrometers. So something really, really small um, that we have to zoom in with. And all of these things can be mixed together again. So keep that in mind. Like, what is that? Okay, yeah, that's kind of a good illustration here. So this little tiny square box right there, that's what five micrometers is, just to look at it in comparison to, to everything. So super, super small. Yeah. It is, yeah, that's, it's gonna be part of that, the Hawthorne group. Um, what we'll see is that adipoldite clay is, that's like the mineral name. Um, so, this isn't the geologic formation term. Um, that's just like the actual mineral. So each one of those little strands is called an adipogite. Like, so they, they could be a different mixture of some clay formation in, throughout the Florida. Okay, so we'll get into the clay and silt stuff, but first let's talk about coarse grain soils. Coarse grain soils behave according to their weight. So we can actually draw little free body diagrams and stuff. And, you know, it's a little bit easier to estimate the physics behind the strength comparison, because what we're getting the strength from is just the connection points between the particles itself. Um, so for this gravitational forces control, um, the strength and the density and everything. So these particles are large enough that they have a large enough mass that if we calculate the weight of them, then it actually makes sense comparatively to all of the other external forces around it. So obviously the angularity plays a big role into that. And we already talked a little bit about that with the void ratio and the relative density and stuff. Um, and there's three different like kind of packs that you could see. We'll see obviously the dense packing here. And that's just where a lot of the void ratio, a lot of the voids are taken with solid material. You can see the opposite of dense is loose. So this could be a grain structure that we see. And obviously the loose is going to have a lower density than our dense soil. And then the other type that we can see sometimes is called a honeycomb. And this is where the depositional process can still play a role too. So we see these larger voids, even though the density may be similar, these voids are concentrated in a certain area. And this is due to the gravitational forces and something that we can call, that we call arching. So you know how like, if you've ever driven on a bridge that just has an arch, right? The arches, redistribute the forces laterally. 
that happens on a super, super small scale with soil itself. And this is actually why sinkholes can form and how we can bridge tunnels under soil and everything, because the soil will naturally want to redistribute any vertical loading horizontally through this arching phenomenon. So it's good, like this is benefit, this helps us with strength as well, but it also makes it a little bit more difficult to characterize because the density is just not always going to be based off of the specific or the same um, packing situation. We could have this honeycomb packing like this. So with coarse grain, again, they behave according to their weight um, and gravitational forces control. Um, but the void ratio and the density cannot alone characterize the behavior, the anticipated engineering behavior. So although they can play a good sign into it, again, the distribution of the voids is also important. Like these two examples here have very similar densities and have very similar void ratios. Because again, void ratio, volume of voids over volume of solid, density is mass of solid divided by total volume, if that's the dry density, whatever. Um, so if we just look at this, and if you were actually like to count the each specific area, you could see that the void ratios and the masses are the same in each little box, but the soil fabric and the structure is completely different. So the structure and the angularity plays a big role. And these are all based off of the deposition slash geology. So again, the differences between how the soil got there, whether it was gravitational, colloidal particles, or um, yeah, gravitational, aeolian, lacustrine, like if it's a lake, just if a lake particle is just settling over time, and we probably have something that looks like this, where all these particles are just stacking up because they float down together. Um, if it's been deposited by like a rushing river, then the particles are probably less distributed, right? They're probably like not following a certain order. So understanding the deposition is important because that sheds light into the anticipated structure and angularity, um, which can tell us also about the, the overall strength as well as the pore space and the, the permeability as well. So like how water is gonna flow through it. So these are some of the fine grain, grain sizes. So this is fine grained, specifically for clays. Um, and these are some other types of, of pictures. So this one is kaolinite, which is another type of mineralogy. A lot of times you'll see these ites at the end of these clays. Um, and that's just because that's the actual mineral crystal that is forming, you know, like a lot of like from the rock collection days and stuff like the ites will have like the actual mineral itself. So we're looking at the specific mineral for clays because it's that small. So um, again, they, what you can see here, this one's a little bit harder to tell, but it's all these like little octagons stacked on top of each other. And then same with here, this kaolinite, this is like looking at like a little profile view of these octagons just stacked on top of each other. So it's like a, almost like a old book. That's just all these pages stacked up. Um, and you can see like, like this is also what gives it its strength too. Like has anyone tried to rip like a phone book in half? Really? Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it like people do it before, but it's really hard like to rip books. Like even though each little tiny particle, ha each page has a low strength and you can do it. <laughs> he does, yeah. There's some secret to it. It's like the same as like ripping an apple in half or something too. I don't know. It's just... I don't think we can give out secrets in this class. It's a, it's a code, but it's really hard to do, like to rip any book because it's all these individual things stacked up against each other. And that's the same with clay. So that's why like working with that clay in the lab, if you were trying to separate it, it was much more harder than sands and stuff um, because they're just all these particles tightly packed. Um, so the, even though the 
um, what am I saying here? So the, these clay particles form, I want this erase. This is showing up there. These clay particles form mainly through chemical weathering. So like an example would be like hydrolysis. I think this is how you spell it. This one, right? Yeah. So the slow breakdown of different types of minerals into its basic like crystal structure um, that will form these clays. So a lot of times we'll see these clays as residual soils, like um, in Florida, the limestone being weathered below us um, through the groundwater um, will form what's called lime silts. And eventually it would form what's called a lime like clay or just lime. Um, and those lime silts are just really small particles due to the chemical weathering where sands and or gravel sands and silts, most of those are going to be formed by like physical weathering, such as abrasion or that type of stuff, like wind, rain, water, all the, the physical aspects of it. So if we were to zoom in at these particles really, really close, we would get these exact scientific looking things of little triangles put together. <laughs> so the clay mineralogy plays a big role and we're not gonna get too much into it here. Um, this is more so for our geology friends, but it still plays a role on the engineering behavior. Um, the clay minerals in, uh, are consistent of aluminum silicates and they're composed of, um, fancy words, different structures called silica tetrahedron and then alumina, alumina, alumina. Octahedron. This recording is going to sound beautiful in 0.5 speed. I mean, octahedron. But these are important because they combine to form these sheets. And that's what we saw in the pictures before. will form these octahedral sheets. And these sheets, again, are on like the molecular level. So if we threw water you know, somewhere in here, we're talking about like the same ish size particles. So the water can affect how these sheets are laid on top of each other. And the chemistry of the water can also affect that as well. So not only does the amount of water play a role, but the other like salty water or any like heavy water could also change how these sheets are stacked on top of each other. So there's three most widely used clay minerals. So these are things that you will hear if you work in Florida, because these are the three like main types of, of clay minerals. Now, again, like different formation, geological formations, like, like Hawthorne clay or Buckshot clay or Young's Bay clay, like all of these like cities have their famous geologic formations, that's not this. This is the actual mineral that's made up of those clays itself. Say, so kaolinite is this one here. And here you can see these sheets stacked on top of each other and like the different actual like um, molecules that compose of this. Kaolinite, I think like if you've ever worked in, uh, like pottery or something. This is like the clay that they will use for, for pottery a lot of the times because um, it doesn't like change in whenever you dry it out too much. The other one is phyllite. Again, all the little ites there. And then our personal favorite here, Montmorillonite. They were like, the first two are too easy to say. We're going to throw, let's make it more complicated. So these are all to scale. So these are the actual sheets stacked off on top of each other. So even in the clay, like we see various sizes and different structures of um, material. So the Montmorillonite, this stuff, this stuff, what you'll see like throughout the semester or what you'll see um, whenever we if you start working, anytime you see a place with a heavy Montmorillonite, like a clay that has a heavy Montmorillonite uh, 
like crystal structure. Um, and then this stuff swells and shrinks a lot. So this, like in pottery class, you don't use this type of clay because if you were making it as a wet clay and then sticking it in the oven, it would just like shatter because it would shrink too much. So like the, the clays in Texas or Louisiana that you may have heard of like that, these expansive clays, we have some in Gainesville, but um, out in like Texas and area, like this clay, like if it gets wet, it'll like grow in volume. And that's because of these Montmorillonite, Mont that's because of these layers right here, the water in here will push these things back and forth um, since it's all just this water in, in between it. So you may see these little things, a like the Norwegian A here, or whatever. This is actually a very, very small unit of measurement. So one millimeter, right? Super, super small, one millimeter, one like width of hair is actually equal to about 18 million of those things, angstroms, right? Or no, atomic units. So again, what we're saying here super small so that's why the water is important remember the quick clay stuff that i showed the beginning of like the the semester like those norwegian clays that is the reason why that happens again is because of the water in between the clays and that, like there's a video here i can share at the end um, if you want to learn more about it but that's why like the the type of water the salt content of the water you know, Florida, the, the iron content, the potassium content, or whatever type of salt you have in the water plays a big role in how these things stack on top of each other and then the overall strength that these have too. Okay, so some more little chemistry pictures here. Um, due to the atomic structure of clay, uh, the clay particles carry a negative net charge on their structures. So clay particles. So this is what gives clay particles that stickiness, the cohesiveness. Um, soap particles, everyone, does everyone know how soap works? You got one end of the molecule that likes to stick to stuff, the other end likes to stick to water. So the, that end sticks to the trash, this end sticks to the water, and then it gets carried into the sink. So clay particles kind of have a similar thing. Like one end of the clay particle wants to stick to the other end of the clay particle. So they stack and they have this cohesive nature be between it. So the, all of these little pictures kind of illustrate that. Again, we're looking at the clay particle surface right here. So this is the actual like clay particle and the, the water within the whatever it's suspended in um, will then create this different cation and anion relationship as it goes further away. So depending on what the clay is actually made of, and again, the depositional process depends on how much water is going to want to be attracted, which could also then affect the, the swelling behavior of it. So since water molecules are dipolar, which means that one side is positive, one side is has a negative charge, the water and the clay attract. Which is why the water greatly affects the behavior of the clay. So whenever we do the Atterberg content test or the Atterberg limit test in the lab, um, you'll see firsthand like how just adding a little bit of water to our clay sample um, will completely change it. It'll change it from like a Play-Doh to a liquid to like a, you know, a solid material. So the overall fine grain, Oh, I forgot this was a little gift. That's cool. The overall fine grain particle, um, electro instead of gravitational, electrostatic forces control um, these 
So has everyone done this, like been the cool kid out of McDonald's in third grade and making it? Yeah. So that's basically what's happening with the, the clay particles. Like again, like the water is getting in between these stacked clay particles and it's like an accordion. It's pushing each individual clay particle away, but each individual clay particle movement is then exponentially increased. And then we actually have movement at the surface. So this is all due to the electrostatic forces. You're not actually like putting any like pressure on these clays to get them to swell. It's just the water presence is causing it to, to move apart. So this is why I've said it before, but we'll just write it down here. The chemistry, of course, this is the spot that doesn't work. So that's where it says chemistry in the pore water is important. There's a lot of research going on on like the mineralogy because if you think about these scanning electron microscopes haven't been around for too long. So now that we can actually see what that clay structure looks like, everyone's like, sweet, let's look at it. Let's try to figure out it on a nano like micro scale instead of the, the actual like physical, like large scale. So there can be different types of structures of clay particles, again, based off of that deposition and everything. And again, this whole time, keep in mind that it's often found that this, these particles are mixed in with other particles too. So even though we do have like a pure clay sample, there still could be a lot of silt mixed into that. And there could be some even sands and some gravels mixed into those clays as well. So what we have, like this could be like, some terms are called like flock, oh gosh, flocculated. <laughs> Flocculated just means it's like, like put like stuck together, like the structure is stuck together. On the other side of it, the clay particles could be dispersed. And that's where all of them aren't touching. So again, this is based off of the geologic deposition of it. So the big thing that this affects is these clays can shrink or swell so based off of the water, they can exchange in volume simply because of the presence of water. And then they can also change plasticity. So if they change plasticity, that means it's changing the strength. So a clay at a certain moisture content is gonna have a completely different strength than that same clay at a different moisture content. So defining that moisture content, that simple test we did is really important in clays because that sheds light into how much load it can handle and how much it's going to compress um, when we add a load on top of it. So another property that we see of clays is what's called it's the clay sensitivity. So although these two pictures kind of like, you got to look at them really hard to, to see the difference here. These two images are just examples, like little cartoons of what the clay would look like deposited in different types of water. So this is actually clay deposited in fresh water. And then this is in salt water. And again, what we see a combination is, is we see these clay particles. These are the little like stringy guys. And then we also see silt particles. So this has silt mixed in too. But in freshwater, what we'll often see are these clay particles are able to stack on top of each other a little bit better. So we see more contact, right? So you see these con contacts here. And this structural fabric of the clay gives it a little bit more strength because those two particles are closer together. So the um, electrostatic forces are holding them in much more tighter. Um, so the strength will go up, there's more cohesion. In salt water, some marine set marine clays that have salt water, um, then we see more dispersion. So we see a dispersed because of those salt particles. So again, what we like, there's actually like salt molecules larger molecules than the water molecules that are holding these things apart. And that's actually what happened with the Norwegian quick clay stuff. Um, these, that clay soil was um, 
deposited in salt water. And then over time, those salts holding together those like the structure like that eventually got washed out and replaced with fresh water. So now we have a soil that has a fabric and a structure made for salt water, but no salt holding it together anymore. So that's how it can fail and just like fail really quickly. And once it fails, then it just goes progressively. It's just like being held together only by these little tiny connection points because that salt chemistry is gone. So there's a, a certain like way of defining that nature of clay. So its ability to form a quick clay or fail rapidly. And that's called the clay sensitivity. This is a weird word, but basically what it is, is the strength in its natural. So the strength of the clay divided by the strength remolded. So if we were to take that clay, pull it up out of the ground, mix it up, and then let it settle and harden again, that would be its remolded clay. So if it has a super high strength in its natural state, and then a really, really low strength in its remolded state, then it is a more sensitive clay. So you can see down here, these once we start getting into some of these large numbers, we call these quick clays. These are really bad. That's those Norwegian like clays that will fail super quick. And once they start failing, it just keeps going and keep, keeps going. Because as soon as it changes its structural fabric, it loses all of its strength. So it's, it's only these little tiny points holding it together. It's not a good thing. So a lot of times, luckily, we don't have this in Florida too much. But if you work up north or anywhere where there was like used to be glaciers or anything like that, um, then you would do these additional tests. You take a sample of clay, you would test it, and then you would remold it and then test it again to determine its sensitivity, because that is another thing that you have to, um, to check before that. So clay sensitivity is another one. So um, these are some YouTube videos. I'm not going to show them in class, um, but I'll post them on the Canvas link. Um, these, again, I, I showed the, the Norwegian quick clay one. Um, this guy actually like does a good job illustrating how it works and what happens, like does an experiment. You can take this clay, you can mix it, and then you pour salt in it, and it pretty much hardens automatically. So it's kind of interesting to see it in the lab. Um, and then a few other interesting videos on liquefaction. This guy, even though he's might be old now, I don't know how fast things go out, but the Mark Rober guy, he has like an interesting liquid uh, sand hot tub. So he shows how the grains of sand actually can be fluidized um, just based off of blowing air through it. So that those gravitational forces holding the grains together go away. Um, and this is a real thing called liquefaction in soil. And that's from that earthquake video that I showed where those cars are like sunk in water. It's like a car sticking out like that. That's a car sticking out of water. This is why I'm a civil engineer, guys. I'm not an art engineer. Um, so you can watch those two videos, um, and that'd be. I think these are helpful to illustrate the like the actual physical behavior of sands and clays. Because us engineers like to focus on the math and all that fun stuff, but if we start with understanding the physical behavior, it makes the math a little bit easier, in my in my opinion. Um, so yeah, that's it for this class. I will post about what Thursday's class is going to look like um, if we're going to do the exam review then or next Tuesday. So I'll see you guys in lab here in a little bit. See everybody else on Thursday.